What's up, y'all? It's your boy Aaron. I'm here with another video. Super excited. Um, for those of y'all who are observant, you're probably thinking, how come this dude took three years to release his first three videos and now he's released like three videos in a month? Um, the answer to that is very simple. It's called unemployment. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking about like what my goal is for this channel, and I definitely want to shift it to talk more about anarchist praxis, um, and just, you know, how we can deal with our ongoing climate apocalypse. Um, but I realized as a baseline to most climate related issues and some other issues too, um, particularly, you know, arguments that people have about trans folks, a lot of that stuff is based on, you know, like the concept of nature and what nature is. Um, so. I thought that we could start by just first taking a look at what is the concept of nature, how does it apply, what are its different uses, and how do we as humans relate to nature. Um, so I thought it'd be cute to start out in my vegetable garden. Um, so much I love to my plants. There's not much going on now. It's just February, but hopefully in a few weeks things will be popping off here, and who knows, maybe I'll post an update. But first, um, it's fucking cold out here, so let's switch to the painting camera. So ski. Hey folks, so of course in video essay land, this is the place where normally I would start with the definition. Um, but I think the whole purpose of this video is to highlight how problematic it is to try to define the term nature. Um, so for the, our purposes, I'm just going to start by talking about um, its contemporary usage um, in languages based on Anglo-European cultures. Um, while I do that, you can see I'm doing a cute painting of some mushrooms. I quickly showed the sketch that it was based on, which I did a couple of years ago. Um, so in the Western context, nature is based on the pastoral trope. Um, so we're thinking about like images of fields, shepherd boys and sheep, milkmaids, woodland nymphs. Um, this idea goes back pretty long. Um, you can definitely see traces of it, for example, in Greek mythology. Um, and it's generally used to describe ideas of romance and beauty. Um, in the book, The Invention of Nature, Andrea Wolfe talks about how the Western notion of nature dates back to the Romantic era, so the late 1700s and 18, early 1800s. Um, particularly, this time was also sort of the beginning of modern capitalism. Uh, and so at this time, people were noticing that like industrialization was beginning to destroy most of the nature that was around people. Um, and as I talked about extensively in my um, my gender videos, um, we have to recall that this is after the witch trials and the destruction of nature-based religions that people had participated in up until the arrival of Christianity. Um, and so during this romantic period, there was a big interest in the pastoral. And what's kind of cool about it is that it was sort of a radical move because it, you know, reminded people how nice things were before capitalism colonialism and land enclosure, which was the privatization of land in Europe. Um, though, of course, the romantic notion of nature kind of romanticized the feudal period that came before um, and was based on a more idealized version of what people's relationship to nature had been more than like what it actually was. Um, and this sort of romantic uh, natural trope was recuperated into a trend of European guys going on tours to areas that were still quote unquote natural and kind of like just experiencing the wild raw dogness of nature itself. Um, so you can kind of see this in Jorge Luis Borges stories um, and the writings of Alexander von Humboldt, who um, Wolf credits with the invention of nature after which she titled her book. Um, and basically he was one of the first naturalists, so a person who wasn't necessarily a biologist or scientist, though he kind of prefigured those roles. Um, and, you know, just by writing about his, his travels in, you know, contemporary South America um, and how basically he was affected by this natural environment, which was not as present in Europe. 
You can also see these tropes of nature in the Origin of Species and other writings by Darwin where he chronicles basically also his travels around um, you know, the, the indigenous lands that now are known as South America. Um, so one interesting question that arises with all of this is the question of whether we're inside or outside of nature. Um, the modern Western notion that's des descended from these romantic ideals kind of presumes by default that we're outside of it, that we're observers, that we might be in awe of the beauty of nature, but we're not exactly part of it. Um, the interesting thing is this specifically applies to the white Western subject in representations that these Euro adventure dudes were creating. The indigenous peoples of the places that they were visit would be considered part of the fauna. Um, for example, a text that I talked about in my Am I Black video um, called Description de l'Egypte um, is both a geographical, naturalist, cultural, and archaeological description of Egypt because if you're not white, geography, archaeology, biology, and anthropology are all the same topic. Um, <clears throat> But what we should highlight here is that this is not actually the only model of nature and that we can actually step back and kind of talk about what, um, what different ideas that people have about nature and how those different ideas kind of function in the world. So this list of the different versions of the idea of nature is loosely based off the writings of Murray Bookchin. Um, I'm not going to go too much into his writing. Um, there's an excellent YouTuber called Nowhere Grotesque who has a really great series about Bookchin, Animal Crossing, and Japanese anarchism, so I'll link that in the description. Um, but basically, Bookchin proposes a few different frameworks for how different societies view their relationship to nature. So the first one is sort of the Western one that I was discussing, in which people basically see themselves, that's, they basically see that society is above nature or greater than nature. Um, and so within this framework, you know, it centers humans, um, it presumes nature has nothing to do with us, and as I was mentioning before, it's deeply colonial. Um, this is also the view of science as we mostly know it today. Um, it kind of incorporates the idea that nature can be totally known and systematized, that everything that is out there, all of the natural processes can be understood within our human logic. Um, the flip side of this perspective is the view that nature is above society. Um, so the feminist scholar who draws a lot of her work from Bookchin's um, Chaya Heller um, says that this version of nature, the idea that like, you know, everything, everything in the natural world is better than human society, is kind of based on the trope of like Mother Earth or Gaia, um, which has a tendency to feminize and therefore objectify nature. Um, also potentially it's kind of orientalist, like nature is some kind of exotic other thing that we, the Western subject, can't really uh, understand or relate to. Another kind of problematic issue with this perspective is um, elucidated by something that folks were saying a lot at the beginning of the pandemic, which was the idea that, quote, humans are the virus. Um, as you can imagine, this kind of perspective leads to eco-fascism because, of course, oftentimes people who say this are talking about specific kinds of humans and usually not themselves. Um, and this kind of like, hyper emphasis on what is natural is actually quite conservative because it's used to justify arguments about human culture that are based in an idea of what nature is and how we should go back to that. So one example of that might be Jordan Peterson's notion of hierarchy, which he justifies by comparing humans to lobsters or um, uh, women transphobes uh, that, you know, like biological uh, gender or sex is the only thing that matters based on a very limited notion of biology and honestly based on no comparisons to other species with, which have a great variety of sexual dimorphism and varieties of genders. The third view of nature that's relevant to talk about is the idea that society and nature are the same thing. 
Um, Bookchin really doesn't like this one for some reason. Um, basically what he says is that it's hard to do environmentalist critiques because basically if everything we do is natural, how can we criticize human practices like fracking or factory farming um, or other forms of environmental degradation? Um, I don't really believe this. Um, I think that the solution to the issue that Bookchin is posing is just that we have to rely on something other than quote unquote naturalness to make our judgments of what's right and wrong. After all, plenty of other species overuse their resources, exceed their carrying capacity and die out. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a good idea for us to do the same thing. I'm also very interested in this idea that nature and society are the same because it's highly reflected in indigenous understandings. Um, the scholar Gregory Cahate specifically states that, you know, one of the essential conflicts between colonial and indigenous worldviews is that colonial world worldviews are anthropocentric, which means that they are focused on humans, whereas indigenous worldviews are grounded on the interconnectedness of humans with the land and natural forces in general, as well as all other living creatures. Um, in that way, indigenous cultures believe, you know, that a healthy environment, healthy culture, and healthy people are all the same thing. Um, the Anishinaabe botanist Robin Wall Kimmerer describes in writing Sweetgrass how, you know, what we should strive to is to see ourselves as integrated in a web of relationships with other species and even to recognize their subjectivity. Um, she has a really fascinating conversation in the podcast on being where she talks about how instead of referring to natural beings as it or using gendered pronouns for them, she proposes a pronoun based on Anishinaabe Moen uh, called ki, which would basically, first of all, acknowledge the energy of these beings, but also acknowledge that they have subjectivities too. Um, some indigenous scholars take this in a really fun direction. I'm thinking of the work of um, Susatan Wapitan Oyate scholar, um, Kim Talbert, who brings forward this idea of ecosexuality, um, which acknowledges the desire, competition, and understanding that we have with other species. I think this is a really fascinating perspective because there definitely is a kind of eroticism in eating someone, in being eating, in hunting, in the chase. I mean, that's why people are into vor. <laughs> um, and this is not unique to um, in terms of Turtle Island, um, in the book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, uh, the scholar Anna Lohenhaupt Singh um, describes the mundane and ongoing ways that we are shaped and shape, are shaped by and shape nature. Um, so she traces the history and relationships between humans, Matsutake mushrooms, and the pine and oak trees that they grow with from medieval China to the Japanese pastoral trope to undocumented Cambodian workers in third growth forests in Oregon. Um, so of course I'm biased that this view that society and nature are continuous with each other is the best one. Um, I think that it actually is very helpful. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, this is not the perspective that Bookchin takes. According to Bookchin, nature and society are a dialectic because he was just obsessed with creating a new version of Marxism. Um, and so if you're not familiar with Marxist theory, basically the idea of a dialectic is that um, two initially opposing seeming forces interact with each other and kind of influence each other toward um, a kind of synthesis. So the idea is that you have a thesis and then an antithesis, you know, two arguments that oppose each other. And then by going back and forth several times, they reach something eventually that is a combination of the two. Um, so basically Bookchin argues that society emerges from nature and then it influences nature. And then society is once again influenced by nature and vice versa on and on and on forever. Um, I honestly think there's very little difference between this perspective and the perspective that nature and society are the same, other than that it encourages you to see nature as a monolith separate from human society, rather than a web of interactions between individuals and groups of different species. There is no one nature and there is no one society. There are many natures and societies which evolve together as an interdependent mesh. Or, I don't know, 
a rhizome or something. Um, but you know, Bookchin fans, please yell at me in the comments below. So now that we've considered a few perspectives on what nature is, we have to return to the question of whether we, as, as modern capitalist subjects, are inside or outside of nature. Um, while I believe that nature and society are the same thing, I have to also acknowledge that, of course, within our capitalist industrialized culture, we don't feel like we're inside of nature. Most of the time, we feel like we're very removed from it. But modern culture often reveals glimpses of a deep longing for nature, a fascination where natural phenomena break through the cracks. Again, I would reference some of the footage that was um, very popular at the beginning of COVID of animals traveling through city streets, the return of whales to urban coastal areas. Um, and people are really interested in this because we feel connected to nature and we feel that we want to return to our relationship with it. Um, but most of the time in our lives, nature is contained and is subjugated to gardens and zoos and into our screens. And we also feel trapped and confined in the same way that these natural beings also are. Um, one of the reactions that humans have to this idea that we are outside of nature is a series of back to the land movements that have become increasingly popular in contemporary times. Um, one popular one among Gen Z is the idea of cottage core. Um, so this is the idea of essentially, you know, returning to a small cottage in a pastoral area, um, farming or living off the land. Um, what I find interesting about this idea is that it is highly romanticized. In particular, it romanticizes a particular kind of femininity, land ownership, and small household style individualism. Um, in my experience, this perspective is inherently colonial in most of the places where it's popular. And for millennials, it's often primarily an aesthetic fantasy because we actually can't access that kind of life in most cases because land ownership is prohibitively expensive and oftentimes we have to work under capitalist cities because that's where jobs are. Um, I posted some memes back when I was on Instagram kind of reflecting on this um, and people were really upset by it um, for reasons that I'll talk about a little more later. But one of the main critiques that I received is that this is a largely queer movement, at least that's what some people believe. Um, and what I would say is that while there is a queer subset of this movement, it is still largely white and we can't ignore how much the aesthetic of cottage core overlaps with the neo-fascist trad wife, uh, the prepper aesthetic and other um, far right aesthetics. Uh, plus, if you're a queer who actually tries to move to the country, you realize how fucking miserable it is, as emphasized by the popular gay cottagecore YouTuber, The Green Witch, in a video where she did details how she had to leave the cottage that she was living in in rural Virginia due to homophobia, and she felt much safer in the city. If you do try to stay in a rural place, it's not a beautiful escape from capitalism and industrial oppression, but often an entry into a new kind of small, closed society. Speaking for myself, I'm a trans person of color who lives in a rural place, and I'm losing count how many times my friends and family members have begged me to leave for my own safety and well-being due to the number of racist incidents at, that I have experienced living here. Another sort of back to the land or back to nature movement that's popular in contemporary times is neo-New Ageism or neo-Paganism. Again, this is based on a longing for nature and a sense of spiritual emptiness that people have under capitalism. Um, so people have this new desire to connect with nature-based spiritual practices. Um, you know, this is all your, your Reiki masters, your um, crystal witches, um, and all of the chicks that you know that are obsessed with essential oils. Um, 
Of course, this perspective actually often leads to more cultural appropriation and desecration of nature because people lack access to the land so that they can engage in these practices directly, and they also lack access to their own cultural traditions, so they just steal the cultural traditions of others. Um, and this goes back to how capitalism can recuperate many forms of resistance to it rather than these supposedly nature-based practices actually growing people's relationship with the land and with other species, um, their desire to connect with nature often just gets fed back to them as products. Bristols, candles, Sephora smudge sticks. Um, as one of the deep ironies of capitalism, it can recuperate absolutely anything and it just sells us back the idea of environmentalism and spirituality. One of the stronger but less popular reactions to this is um, different kinds of primitivism, such as neo-Luddite movements, anarcho-primitivism, um, and some subsets of prepper culture. Um, these ideologies basically reject technology altogether and argue that we should go back to a pure state of nature in which we were in direct relationship with the land. Um, Again, this is based on a colonial ideology. Um, basically, it's like how the Euro Explorer Bros imagined indigenous people, that they were part of something called nature and that therefore they didn't have a sense of culture, science, or technology. Um, one of the versions of this I find really interesting is how oftentimes people talk about the pre-colonial environments here in North America as if they were unmaintained. Well, where I live, um, people often seek to return something called the Gary Oak ecosystem. Um, and they're continually upset that when land is left unmanaged, instead of that returning, what actually comes into the land is a species of plant from Scotland called broom which is a uh, succession species. And the reason that the ecosystem that the colonists think was the default doesn't return is because it was not there in a vacuum, but in fact, indigenous peoples have continually managed the land in their own way. It's just that they had forms of land management that were more in harmony with the systems that are already around. Um, so things like forest farming or controlled burning that are not, you know, just leaving nature alone to do what it does because we're part of what nature does, but which relies on a complex understanding of nature. Um, another common critique of different versions of primitivism is that it disregards people who depend on technology um, in one form or another, such as chronically ill or disabled folks and trans folks on pharmaceutical horses. Um, I think this is a serious critique, and I think that if your you know, idea of returning to nature relies on abandoning certain sets of people, once again, it's simply eco-fascism. Finally, another land or um, renaturalization movement is that of solar punk. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this one because the absolute goat St. Andrewism has a great number of video essays which touch on this topic um, in quite a lot of detail. Um, but essentially, this is the idea of a tech augmented green future. Um, so community gardens, green roofs, and solar panels. Um, I think that this idea has radical potential, but it has to go beyond the purely aesthetic, otherwise it's just greenwashing. We've already seen how corporations are already trying to sell us back the idea of a kind of new environmental capitalism, um, which this cannot be part of, but has to actually involve communal ethics um, and a deep care for the land that goes beyond simply trying to extract more from it. Um, one thing that I want to say, and I kind of started to mention before, is that people get super, super defensive when you critique these kinds of movements. And I think one of the reasons why is because sometimes it can sound like what you're critiquing is their desire to return to nature, their yearning for nature itself. And I really relate to this. I mean, I earnestly participate in some of these movements or some some behaviors that these movements advocate for myself 
you know, I do a herbalism, I grow a vegetable garden, I participate in nature-based spirituality, but I, I just want to say, like, I'm trying to critique these tendencies in myself as well, and it's not a throw out the baby with the bathwater kind of situation. I'm not saying that people's desire to live more environmentally is a bad thing. What I am saying is that if that continues to be based on individuality, colonial logics and capitalism that is just not going to do what the key is not to center our natural um, yearnings around individuality or a sense of dominance but to build and grow with other people and by people i don't just mean humans i mean all species of people um, and not just the people who are closest to us or most like us um, this means local projects that go beyond neighborhood borders, which are often deliberately segregated, um, should involve uh, partnerships with unhoused folks and other people on the margins, solidarity with indigenous sovereignty movements, um, and something that is not just aesthetic or appropriative. Um, as we know, decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, it's not just about acknowledging territory or, you know, slapping indigenous names on things, but actually returning land and control to indigenous people, especially because, again, we need to recognize that traditional ecological knowledge is integral to putting us back into a proper relationship with the environment around us. Um, and so what this kind of has to be is not some sort of like appropriative, like, oh, I live territory, so I'm going to be Coast Salish kind of logic. But in fact, you know, understanding our own ancestral natural traditions, learning about local indigenous traditions and understanding how we as individuals can relate to both of those things in a way that's harmonious and in a way that returns us back to um, a proper relationship with the land around us and once again has to always be rooted in support for and growing pushes towards indigenous control of land and resources. Um, ultimately the love of this is desire to move beyond the human. After all, asking what nature is or how we should relate to it kind of decenters what nature really is, a web of relationships between species that we're intrinsically part of, from the plants, animals, and fungi that we eat, to the bacteria that live inside of us, to the viruses that try and invade us, to the habitats that we steward or destroy. We actually don't have a choice as to whether we relate to nature or not. And even if you live in an apartment, a major metropolitan city, there are still other species around you that you are interacting with. Um, and I think that when we think of nature as this monolithic thing, we lose sight of that very easily because we think of ourselves so much as outside of it. But we rarely consider how we relate to nature in the moments where it's actually happening. Um, when you lock eyes with a deer across the street in the middle of the night and you both stare at each other wondering whether to run, you are in nature. When you see a raccoon um, rummaging your trash can, you understand that you are inside of and part of nature. When you eat another animal or a plant or a fungus, you are inside of nature. We are intrinsically inside of these webs of relationships. Um, and I think one of the essential things that we have to participate in is understanding that, understanding that what we are doing in relationship to other species is not natural or unnatural, but simply whether it's good stewardship or not. Um, or to, to quote the uh, very controversial figure, Alistair Crowley, nature is a continuous phenomenon that we do not know in all cases how things are connected. Hey y'all, I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, rather than whacking you all over the head with a really uh, wrapping it up type of conclusion, I thought I would end with a poem. Um, this piece is called A Thousand Plateaus 
après Deleuz et Guattari. I'm writing this poem in blue pencil, coloring the lines as they come, like waves riding back to sea from shore, rearranging their successors as they go, each one a feather, a fingerprint, pressing a seed into soil, dirt crusting in the whorls. Sometimes, when my body feels like a prison of flesh, I remember the Escherichia, Lactobacilli, Bifidobacteria riding around in it with me, living, eating, encountering one another, reproducing, dying, their secretions, my digestive enzymes, the protective layer of my skin, my very thoughts. After all, if we are a multitude, the body without organs, how can I say I'm piloting this car? Which swallow drives the murmuration? Which ant instructs which other ant where to gather and which ginormous morsels to tow back to feed the hill? We are all just a lot of water falling, tracing parabolic arcs according to gravity and the rocks below the surface different and the same each time. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.